The genre is hard to define because it's so huge. And as some people like to say, well, you can make a musical out of anything. I don't know that that's really true. Um, but it's a very wide genre. And uh, the main thing is to remember it is musical theater. It's theater, number one. It's so great to meet you here on Zoom, John. Yeah, same thing. I mean, you are, I mean, not many people can say that they work from Middle Earth to the top of the Swiss Alps, can they? Mm, yeah, it's a, well, yeah, it's a bit unusual, I guess, but uh, <laughs> it's a, shall we say, it's a very fortunate position to be in. Yeah, I can imagine. What a creative person you are. Well, I mean, I think the, the fortunate thing in this uh, in this particular profession is, you know, one has an opportunity to kind of chase things that one's interested in, and you know, meet, of course, meet a lot of great people, a lot of creative people, and figure out how they think, you know, and have my little voice, you know, uh, in uh, or added into the mix. So it's good. It's a it's a, a bit of a luxury, I suppose. Well, I think it's about uh, you almost, you're a um, making dreams come true type of person because you must imagine these things and then see how it really evolves and how it comes to free, fruition. Well, yeah, I mean, this is part of it that is maybe the best. Uh, as, you know, at the beginning of any of these projects, there's not even a blank piece of paper. You know, it, think, it sort of just bounces around in my mind. I think, hmm, what could this be? Knowing that my own fantasy and my own image isn't necessarily what it's going to be in the end on stage. But uh, but this is a big playground uh, to think about what could this be? Um, I suppose in, in my particular position, I, I see it as a pond. There's a very still pond. And I get to throw the first stone into the pond. And I know that um, as soon as it lands, there's going to be it's going to be a little ripple going out in all directions. And this will affect basically everything um, to some degree in whatever the project ends up uh, looking like in the end. Well, I've spoken to um, uh, animator, a, a director from Disney animation mm -hmm. and he said this exactly what you're talking about now it's like putting it out there and then everybody who works on this project brings something to the project and, yes. and it's this this wonderful collaboration and like you say it ends up I don't know if you if you find it as well but he said it ends up more than he expected it to be yeah that's that's the truth um it's rare that something will end up being totally different and, and a dis disappointment. That's, I don't know that I've ever had that experience. Um, it always involves other people and other ideas and other perspectives. And in my position, um, I always like to think of it this way. I need to, I need to figure out how, if I bring on a writer, if I don't write it myself and I bring somebody on i need to understand how they think um mm -hmm. this is the first the first step it is and i think it's the most important step number one is you hire good people i mean you have to <laughs> yeah um, yeah you're gonna hire good people and you accept uh, from the beginning hey this is somebody who has a track record or has potential to do something really good um and i need to understand how they think so that when I engage in a discussion with them, um, I'm thinking along similar lines. Of course, I'll bring in my perspective, um, but we'll have some sort of common language. Mm -hmm. So how much do you, uh, uh, I say allow, but but uh, how much <laughs> do you, <laughs> because I think if it's your brainchild, of course, you're passionate about what you want to do and you you see sort of where it needs to go. So how much do you allow people to to change what you initially wanted to do? Um, I would say 
at the very beginning, we come to some sort of common agreement of where the parameters are. Um, and that's extremely important. Uh, Stravinsky uh, spoke about this a lot, about setting parameters. And if you don't set the parameters, you have to work within the parameters. If you don't have very strict parameters, it's it's basically like having a car on sand. It just doesn't go anywhere. So I think with the writers, um, we come to some sort of general agreement of what we're doing. You know, what is this thing going to be? And it may even get down into, okay, how big is it going to be? How big should it be? Um, just so we have some sort of framework within which to concentrate uh, both for the for the writer, the lyricist, um, for the composer. I'm a big believer in visiting locations, uh, particularly for composers. I've had always, I've always had good feedback from composers. Let's say with um, the Heidi musicals that were written in Switzerland, uh, Stephen Keeling was the composer, and he said later it was really important for him just to see this environment uh, before he started composing. And it was also good for the writer, you know, to see and pick up some detail prior to sitting down and getting to work on the thing. But talking about Heidi now um, and and visiting the the environment, I mean, I've also as a child, I, I just loved this the animation um, film yeah. or the, the the program, and um, but I've also always said that I wanted, I wish I could be in that hut with Heidi and her grandpa and right. you know <laughs> eat the cheese and drink the milk and yeah. drink the goats. But this is the the whole setting is really in the mountains and it's outside. So how did you see it on stage? How did you see it as a musical? What was I mean this is this is really if I think about it, it's it must have been very interesting your thought thought process to get it onto a stage yes uh, the idea to do heidi as a musical first came from a swiss friend a musician friend mm -hmm. we had both played in cats a long long time oh, ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. and steph Menz came to me and said oh what do you think about doing a heidi musical and at first i was, I was thinking hmm uh, it's a huge cliche in switzerland of course uh, and not a positive uh, cliche. Uh, but I read the two uh, books by Johanna Spiri and saw that there, there's a reason why those books have been phenomenally successful around the world. Um, there are great characters, great character descriptions, and putting it in historical context, um, we're talking about a Switzerland that was actually quite poor at the time she wrote this. Um, and so there was a different perspective on it. Um, these are people who have a small world. Um, we have one little line in there where the, the blind grandmother says, once I even traveled to Zurich, um, as if that was the biggest thing in her life, you know, to travel 40 kilometers. And we saw this child that we could all identify with who's taken out of her environment she's put it in a foreign environment and she becomes ill as a result and she wants to go back to the mountains uh to her grandfather and to her friend peter um so it's something everybody can identify with where is home particularly today in our in our uh, society because everybody's a nomad practically um mm -hmm. and and people want to know they want some sort of feeling of this is where i belong um and we just thought the story was uh, very powerful. And our attempt was to blow the dust off of it, you know, off of this Heidi cliche and get to the truth. Um, and that's what worked for us and was very successful with the audience. I think the Swiss audience and particularly the critics were thinking, oh, this is just going to be awful. Uh, and when they saw it, um, it's one of the few musicals I can think of where grown men were crying. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it, it turned out to be a very powerful uh, piece. It's funny. It's serious. It's heartbreaking. Uh, and there is a positive re resolution. So we felt we had all of the ingredients necessary uh, to put this thing on stage. And you had asked about you know, what did we see um, prior to it ending up on stage? 
We saw it in a normal theater and how it might look, and we realized ah, there's going to be some difficulty in creating the grandeur of the of the mountains. We were lucky to get it on the first time uh, in an open air stage in Switzerland with a lake in the background and a mountain coming straight down into the lake. So it could not have been better. Mm. I can imagine. Oh, wow. But now for you, did uh, doing this, did you um, did you so go up in the mountains and try and, and visualize or try and, and imagine what it would be like? Because you mentioned that you took the, uh, with the composer, you went up, but for yourself, was it also, is it also important to be there where you want to set the, the story? Well, the fortunate thing at that time is I was living in Switzerland. Oh, so, okay. so yeah. I had had this environment all around me for about 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I had an, a, a quite good idea, you know, what this idea of space of space is and also within that huge space um you know if you go into a valley it's it, what that feels like it's very closed um and the society is very very tight very compressed uh and small things become big things uh and at the same time you have this backdrop uh, of distance and and these huge mountains um and you could understand you could get a feeling of being an individual. Um, it's much stronger if you're standing on a mountain than if you're in the middle of a city, I think, um, where you might feel a little bit lost. Uh, when you're up there, it's a totally different environment, totally different feeling. And it was necessary for me uh, and for the authors you know, to feel this and to see it and to hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, I I was fortunate to to be in a hut like that, not specifically like Heidi's hut, but um, but that typical, you know, this uh, the snow huts, you know, that they go up yeah. in in certain times of the year and that they stay there, and it's very primitive, you know. There's no electricity, yes. and um, and it's it's I do agree. There's a there's a different feeling there. Yeah, we thought it was also important uh, within the piece to, we, we were very uh, consequential about presenting the time. You know, this is like the 1870s, uh, 1860s, 1870s, um, and which is a totally different world than the world today. So we really tried to present that. Um, and we could get a little more of the environment of today when Heidi goes to Frankfurt uh, and in the big city uh, and everything is noisy and active. Uh, and yeah, this this solitude and the small things that become important are lost in the big city. Mm -hmm. So we really try to uh, draw this uh, distinction between the two worlds. Um, that it's not a matter of Heidi's leaving, just leaving the mountains. Uh, she's going to a completely different world. In fact, she doesn't even speak the language that they speak. Um, and in the original production, we did all the scenes that were in the mountains. That was all in Schwitzerdeutsch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and a specific wow. dialect. We did a dialect, which is around Mayenfeld. Um and uh, in Frankfurt, obviously, she spoke uh, high German, or she learns high German. Uh, and all those scenes were in high German. Johanna Spiri, her scenes, uh, together with her husband, Johann Spiri, who is the Stadtschreiber, the, the city uh, clerk, uh, of course, they spoke um, high German because they were very well-educated, very proper, and of course they shouldn't be speaking dialect. So we created only when Heidi and Johanna meet in one of these magical moments, then Johanna reverts to you know her, her natural dialect, uh, which increased or heightened those moments when she's speaking to Heidi and she's speaking to Heidi in Heidi's language. Yeah, so those, uh, those moments were the ones that uh, I think got the grown men to cry. I can imagine, but this just shows, you know, as audience members, we 
we see it or we we experience it, but we don't know the thought process always behind it, you know, and you are the one creating this. You are the one that that's making the if I it's can, a lot of it's, it's a so lot magic. of yeah. uh, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of historical research. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. Reading uh, reading letters be, uh, between Johanna Spiri, although there weren't many left, Johanna Spiri and Betsy Meyer, the uh, sister of Conrad Ferdinand Meyer, uh, they were the, they were very close friends, uh, and something happened. This is what's great about uh, creating something like this. In the second part of Heidi, we have a story a line going on uh, between about their relationship, you know, uh, um, Conrad Ferdinand Meyer and Johanna Spiri and Betsy. So it's kind of a triangle. And we do know historically that Johanna Spiri burnt all of the letters um, uh, between her, well, not all of them, because I read one or two, uh, almost all the letters uh, between her and Betsy Meyer. We know something significant happened. So of course we use that for dramatic purposes. Um, to create a situation where Betsy gets jealous of Johanna uh, regarding her brother, because uh, she had been her brother's secretary for, for years. So, I mean, there's all this sort of stuff that's really interesting. And then we had to make a decision, uh, where do we want that story to take place? And we decided uh, Lake Geneva, Montreux, what could be better? Uh, uh, 1880s, uh, Montreux, this is a great setting to to uh, to put on. And it plays there, and also in the Heidi fantasy world. Uh, at the and we use Heidi as um, represents. Well, she is Johannes Johannes Spiri's alter ego. Um, she Heidi is the person Johannes Spiri wanted to be. Um, and this, of course, taking this perspective, uh, you know, opened up a lot of doors and how we're going to treat uh, this other major figure, Johannes Spiri. So we run this parallel story and it allowed us the opportunity to have, shall we say, sort of, sort of a, a real life level uh, and this level that is um, really Johannes Spiri's alter ego or avatar. Uh, and how the, all that plays out, yeah. You know? But how amazing that you can take something that we see as just this animation or this story, you know, and and make something so deep and so with so many layers and so many levels. Um, how how is it for you when you you must have spent, like you say, so much time researching and thinking about it and. But how does it feel when you finish a project like that? How do you leave this behind or does it stay with okay. you for a long time? Well, I mean, at some point you do you do have to leave it behind. You have to move on to you know new adventures and new topics. Um, and, you know, you have a feeling if you've done the job well, it's very satisfying. Um, and you're hoping that the... You're hoping that it will be seen by another audience, a different audience. You're curious, you know, how would an aud another audience react? And we did have another production at the uh, theater in Dessau um, several years after the, the the production in Switzerland, and it was interesting. Um, the audience in in the comic scenes the audience sometimes laughed in a slightly different place really? or you could feel there was a, an emotional reaction in a, a different place. A lot of them were the same. Um, and then afterwards, the wife of the theater director came up to me. She had been born in the uh, DDR. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, when I was growing up, Heidi was a, was a banned book. We weren't allowed to have it. We couldn't, you couldn't buy it. Really? Um, and I am assuming because she doesn't necessarily follow authority. Maybe that's oh, what yeah. it was. Yeah. And um, she said when she was a young girl, um, one of the relatives, uh, one of her relatives from the uh, from West Germany came over and gave her a book, uh, gave her a Heidi book. And it was her most treasured thing. So she was basically in tears uh, after seeing the show. Mm. Oh, how amazing. 
yeah that you find that different different people react at different times for, and know? for different reasons yeah, yeah that but you know that you, you usually have a feeling that the work is going to function um in front of almost any audience uh or at least that's that's the goal the yeah. goal is to know this will work mm-hmm. um and then if you want to be a little more egomaniacal about it you say i want everybody to stand up because they have to stand up oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not because they bought a ticket but they yeah. don't have a choice they just have to do it yeah i mean that's, yeah. that's the ultimate goal goal and of course that that's extremely satisfying you know when you can get that kind of result we did with that work we managed to get that kind of uh, of a result i mean some of the other works uh, that i have created um uh get different reactions but there's a different goal in the pieces um, heidi just happened to be one of these things you know you can put your whole heart into and it's a it is a family musical adults are going to get something out of it kids are going to get something out of it um other projects are aimed more uh for an adult audience uh, maybe that the themes are um too sophisticated although it's hard to think of things that are really too sophisticated for kids these days but you know the themes are just more adult themes um if, but the result is the same you, you want to move the audience some way you're taking them on a roller coaster ride and the art the art is to decide when does the roller coaster go up and when does it come down how fast does it come down and how fast do you need to get the audience back up uh to another level so the whole thing is a roller coaster ride and my experience uh, in almost all the projects that I've been involved in is that once an outline has been written, a very simple outline, perhaps just a scene, a short description, um, and you just have a lot of pieces of paper, uh, as you would in a film, you just spread them out on a big table and you just stare at it for Mm -hmm. some time and try to taste it. You know, wh- 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 where am I in this story? You know, I'm looking at that p- piece of paper. How do I feel where we are emotionally? And I have a background in music, and I think that has been helpful in that, you know, if you're playing a playing a symphony, uh, wherever you are, you sort of need to know where you are in terms of the whole piece. Um, yeah. And that's that has been very beneficial uh and also the with a musical uh, as soon as it starts the clock is ticking there is no time to waste um mm-hmm. you have you have to tell a story no matter how big it is you need to get that story in at a maximum of two and a half hours of stage time uh and with a 20 minute break you can say that's the maximum um hopefully you can get it down under that Uh, so you have to balance these things and perhaps the trickiest part is the people are going to have an intermission um Mm -hmm. right where do you want to leave them Mm -hmm. of course you want to leave it hanging Uh, so Mm -hmm. when they go out and uh and get an ice cream or get a drink or something that they're, they want to know how this thing is going to go on and how it's going to end. So you have to leave them at that point. And that is often the trickiest part of the whole process. You know, and there with the authors and with the composer, we have to think, okay, um, have we gotten it to a point where all of the stories, all the various elements of, of the larger story, they're all in question. And we know that our audience has to come back, <laughs> we hope. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you have to think about so many things but you have to have also the experience of so many things um in the, in the theater industry so how did your um how did you start in theater or what were you as a child um doing a lot of theater work or music um music um yes my interest at first was in music and primarily classical music um, and I pursued that for a good number of years as a professional horn player. 
um, working in the States and in Mexico, Spain, uh, and uh, Switzerland. Um, and basically, I got into theater um, somewhat by accident. It was through playing, I had played a number of musicals in the US, uh, but shorter term. Um, and then I played Cats for four years, um, like roughly 1,500 performances of this wow. thing. <laughs> you know, you know, so after a while, it's a Zen, it's a Zen mm -hmm. exercise. Um, mm -hmm. And the same thing with the Phantom of the Opera, did a, two years of that. And I became very fascinated with the musical theater world and how the whole thing worked, wh where art and commerce uh, come together, because musical theater is a commercial uh, genre. Um and when one thinks about it, sometimes people are not, especially in Europe or in the German speaking territories in, in, in Europe, uh, there's not a huge appreciation or high appreciation for musical theater, particularly amongst people who are in theater, meaning uh, intendantes, uh, theater directors, mm -hmm. a lot of stage directors don't think that much of it. I remember an interview by Stephanie Karp, who was the an assistant to Christoph Martaller in an interview in the Tagus Anzeiger. She said, art ends with musical. Really? Um, yeah. So I did write back and I listed everybody from George Gershwin to Leonard Bernstein and everybody in between who had contributed to this particular genre with a reminder that you'll be lucky, you know, if your boss is ever in that pantheon of people mm -hmm. um and also the genre is hard to define because it's so huge and as some people like to say well you can make a musical out of anything i don't know that that's really true um but it's a very wide genre and uh, the main thing is to remember it is musical theater it's theater number one um, and this is what separates it, say, from opera. Opera is 90% or 80%, shall we say, uh, about the singing, um, about the music and the singing. Um, the story, of course, is important, but it's not as important as it is in musical theater. And also the acting, the ability of the performers in acting, the actors need the performers need to be able to act well, they need to be able to sing well, and they need to be able to move or dance. They have to do all of this stuff. So it's, you know, it's a Gesamtkunst. Yeah, um, yeah. and we, we look back in the opera world, we can see particular, partic okay, this is the, the great case. It's dealing with, say, a state theater director, it's not terribly crazy about musical theater. And I say, oh, uh, you're doing uh, Zauberflute. Ah, the first musical. And of course, they're stunned for a moment. But then when you think about it, that, yeah. that's a musical. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There's dialogue. There are song, simple songs you can sing. Um, and there's this one, you know, in the, in the original one, there's a wonderful set design, Bühnenbild. Um, okay, maybe there's not a lot of movement in it, but it's a musical. Um, yeah. the, the Puccini operas, what are they? They're stories about common people. Uh, there's a lot of passion and drama in those in those works. And again, there are tunes everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Or Carmen is a great, another one. Car is, Carmen's basically a musical. It just happens to be through composed. But it has all the elements of it. Yeah, that's true. I've I've thought about that also about the operators. I always thought that those were, you know, both. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard to draw. Sometimes it's very hard to draw a line between operetta and musical theater. Um, it, let's say the 1920s is where it really separates. Mm -hmm. um, those are the last Broadway operettas. And then it really goes into this form of musical uh, musical theater, largely driven by Oscar Hammerstein, you know, who insisted that the book, the story, uh, is the central element 
as opposed to the earlier musicals where let's write a lot of great tunes, which will become mm -hmm. jazz standards. And then we'll think about a story that we can, you know, like a Christmas tree, we can mm -hmm. hang the decorations on, on, mm -hmm. on, the, on the story. And Hammerstein said, no, the story is the central element. Uh, and the music um, needs to fit the story. So it was a complete new way of thinking about it. And that has stayed with musical theaters really since uh, Hammerstein, and particularly his when he teamed up with Richard Rogers, who may have been, maybe, the financially, maybe the most successful composer of the 20th century, even though very few people know anything about Richard Rogers. Mm -hmm. Maybe a, a quarter of the jazz standards were written by this guy. Really? Uh, and even pop standards now uh, were written by uh, Richard Rogers. So it's a genre that's not really well known. And I feel that um, at least in these territories, there needs to be more uh, done to present the, the history of the genre uh, and to draw the connections, closer connections. Uh, the, of course, the biggest problem we know in these territories is the A and U, you know, serious, uh, serious theater and uh, entertainment theater, um, mm -hmm. which has been really an unfortunate development in these in these territories i've spoken with uh, particularly one of my colleagues who's with a classic uh, a major classical publishing house we talk about this a and u stuff and how this has to disappear at some point because there's so many works that are in between um is uh candide by bernstein what is that Officially, it's an operetta. He called it an operetta. Uh, one could say it's a musical. One could say it's an opera or an operetta. Um, and we have a good number of works that are in between. So it would be good to have this division um, dissolve uh, so that we can simply write uh, music theater. Um, or theater that has music, however we want to describe it. Um, the music, of course, elevates the um, music, always elevates the uh, um, the expectations because people normally don't walk down the street, you know, singing to each oh, other. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I wish it was like that. So it's a it's a heightened setting anyway. Uh, and you are required to suspend, you have to suspend your belief to a certain degree and it allows you, I think, as an audience member, um, it offers you a space to travel in that you normally don't, normally don't do. So it's very important. And I think the, 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 we need to get rid of this idea that uh, a work by, let's say, Electra by Richard Strauss is uh, more important than uh, a, the musical Carousel by Rodgers and Hammerstein. They're, you know, they're both serious works. They deal with serious themes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they both have great music. So I think the more we, and it's personally, I find it more fun. Uh, you know, I like going to the opera. You know, mm -hmm. I like going to musicals. You know, I like going to to straight theater. Yeah, you know? and people but, need this. But, yeah, but also uh, these. Uh, if you look at the um, the musicals in London, for example, how mm -hmm. long they run, you know, and and how people just go and watch them over and over again. I mean, you hear people that sometimes go and watch Cats five or six times and yeah. and such a long run. So there must be something about these musicals that really um, speak to us. Well, I think it's a mix. I, I, there is, um, uh, shall we say, a little bit on the negative side. Um, there is hype, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you have to go see this show. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that's, that's true. The, the, shall we say, the bigger the show doesn't mean it's better. Yeah. Um, often it's the small shows that are really interesting, the ones that don't run as long. But that development, the idea that a show has to run five, 
10, 20, 30 years, or as we have Starlight Express in Bochum in Germany, which has been running, what, 35 years? Um, you know, this is uh, actors on roller skates pretending to be trains. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, that that triggers something, you know, within people. It's it's fun. It takes me back to my childhood or, or something. And these shows are, they tend to be well-crafted. Um, there is also a, an element of it's an event as opposed to theater. Uh, and that's maybe the downside of this. Uh, and one would like to see maybe a little... Musical theater has become extremely expensive on Broadway or the West End. This is a, a problem. Um, because often the best shows or the really good shows um, are not the monumental works. Mm -hmm. Something like the Book of Mormon, uh, a comedy uh, that's been running in New York for, gosh, I don't know how many years, 15 years, more. Um, it's a wonderful show. It's a wonderful comedy. It's outrageous, written by the guys who uh, write South Park. But... If one looks at that show, it's an old-fashioned, well-constructed musical. In other words, the general rules, the general rules of theater apply. Um, you can only break the rules if you know the rules. You know, you can't just break them just for the heck of it. You have to know yeah. why you're breaking them. Mm -hmm. uh, and those rules are really the, the same rules you have in opera or a play. Uh, it comes down to basic storytelling. Storytelling has um, general rules, um, and you have to know what they are and how these rules work in order to alter them a bit you know, to fit whatever your story is. But you can't just go around breaking the rules all the time. Um, your audience, actually your audience won't like it because they're used to stories having a certain, shall we say, a certain order in which things oh. occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now for you as um, English speaking in, in Germany in, mm -hmm. uh, and doing these uh, German uh, musicals, is that difficult for you or is it, uh, is, is it, I mean, is no. there a challenge for you? No, no. I mean, I speak German. Uh, my kids were born here, uh, mm. so so that's not a problem. Um, mm. And uh, I tend to have an interest wherever I'm living. I get interested in sort of the local stuff. So when I was in Switzerland, of course, I got interested in Swiss stuff. So we did the three three Heidi musicals, a uh, uh, Wilhelm Tell uh, musical, which of course meant researching the early Habsburgs. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And thinking and, and sort of taking perspective, hmm, what if, what would that story have sounded like if Shakespeare had written it instead of Schiller? That was mm -hmm. one of the things I was kind of playing with, um, mm -hmm. because everyone is familiar with the Schiller uh, version of the story. But I was thinking, eh, you know, if if Shakespeare had written it, it would probably be, have been a lot more exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and not as much explaining and more action. Um, so that was something I was sort of playing with. And now that I'm here in, in Berlin, of course, I'm interested in, in uh, stories that take place in Germany in general or stories that are more Berlin-focused. Uh, um, I uh, did a, a musical or, or did the creative worked on a musical called Fuck You, Goethe, based on the film. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's completely different, you know, from doing Heidi and Tell to doing something as outrageous as that. Yeah. Um, but the story, the, the film was a massive success. I only went to see it because my daughter said, oh, Papa, you have to go see this film. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I watched it. And I thought, hey, this is a good comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and about 20 minutes into it, I thought, you know, this actually could be on stage. Mm. So that led to a meeting with Constantine Phil. And I mean, they were brilliant. They said, hmm, why not? Let's do it. Wow. Mm. So then that turned out um, to the 
when I'm a creative developer, at this point, I'm looking for a team. I knew who I wanted to do to do the book and then made the decision uh, together with Christoph uh, Becker of Constantine Music that we're going to take a composer who's not for musical theater and a lyricist who's not for musical theater. And we found two wonderful guys here in Berlin. Um, and was that risky to do that? Of course well, it was risky. Like <laughs> of course, everybody. You can already hear the critics. Oh, you know, I mean, there were the people that hated the film anyway. Yeah, there were those. Um, I wasn't too concerned about about that. Um, but then there's going to be the thing, oh, it's not going to be anywhere as good as the film. Um, you know, ah, this is just commercial. They're just trying to make a lot of money. Um, and when we, you know, we got into the project and we had a lot of fun. I mean, that, that project was a lot of fun doing. And the team, everybody was uh, in sync uh, with what we wanted to do. And we had a lot of freedom uh, from Constantine, um, you know, within, again, within parameters. You know, we weren't going to wow. change the story. Um, we weren't going to give some different message uh, than what's in there. Um, but we saw opportunities. Uh, we saw some things in the film that were very short, like this very short Romeo and Juliet school play thing. And, you know, I thought about it and said, no, we're going to take 12 minutes and we're going to tell the entire Romeo and Juliet in 12 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. in hip hop. Um, oh, wow. So, right. <laughs> so you have an idea, you, 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 you have the possibility, and this is the fun part, to think of something as crazy as that. And we're going to, we are going to tell that story. And boy, we're going to hit every point of Romeo and Juliet, even in detail, in 12 minutes. Amazing. You know? mm -hmm. So you have these opportunities um, uh, to really run with your imagination. At the same time, you have these guardrails uh, to keep you from going off track. Uh, and that's basically, in that particular case, my job was just to, keep an eye in, come into the meetings every now and then, just see where we are. Um, then we had to have, of course, discussions about the language, because language is, is you know, in the films are very profane. Uh, and how far uh, we're going to do it. This is going to be a musical. Should we make it milder uh, because it's a musical? And in the way we decided that would be cheap, um, mm -hmm. that would be an easy thing to do. Uh, but we thought, no, um, then we're not really being true to the original material. One of the things that's important is if you're working with basically somebody else's material, whether it's a film or whether it's a book, um, you do, I think you are morally obliged to not change the author's intentions. Oh, yeah. You can you have to move things around a bit just for simple dramatical purposes and and the situation of stage as opposed to film stage stage does not have a close up you never see somebody's face yeah. really close so you're not going to get any points uh, you know trying to have the actor do too much uh, there it's all the long shot. And basically, your your audience member has one camera in one position. Oh, yeah. And you, and you have to tell that story to each one of those cameras out there in the in the auditorium. I've never uh, thought of that this way, but yeah, that's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you can often notice uh, writers who forget that. They forget that... They, you cannot see it you, in your mind when you're working on this, uh, on these sorts of projects. You cannot see it in a film esque uh, way. You have to, you have to see it from a distance, visually, um, and of course that informs how you're writing. Uh, that maybe you need a broader stroke to things. Um, and certainly the action needs to be broader. It can't be too fine. So all the stuff has to go on when you're trying to feel at the very beginning, you're trying to, you're trying to figure out what is this thing going to be on stage? 
And like I say, you have to, I use the term, you have to taste it. You have to say, yeah, that's it. This is where it has to go. We had a similar thing with the Lord of the Rings um, where the stage director had posed the question, you know, what kind of music, what's, what does music in Middle Earth sound like? Of course, people now are used to the score from the film, Howard Shore's mm -hmm. wonderful score, but we were doing a stage adaptation and okay, music in Middle Earth, what is it? Mm -hmm. um, the director said uh, to the music supervisor, Chris Nightingale, and to me, he said he wanted folk tradition that we can't put our finger on. That's difficult to now. Now go concept. out. And find, now go out and find that. <laughs> that was the so that you know that was an assignment. You know, sort of mm -hmm. in, in what I do, that's the type of assignment I might get. You know, okay, go, come back with the with the sound of Middle Earth. Okay, you know, <laughs> but we did. Mm -hmm. We did by finding uh, an Indian composer, A. R. Rahman, who's perhaps the most important Bollywood uh, composer. Um, and I located a Finnish folk group called Vatana, um, who, strangely enough, um, Actually, after hearing just uh, from a CD, hearing a, a little bit of their music, I knew this is this is this is Middle Earth, you know. And I, I mm -hmm. called up London and said, "Listen to this. This is Middle Earth." Um, when speaking with the uh, with the Finns, um, they said, "Well, they basically they have based all of their lyrics on the Finnish Kalava, uh, um, the national mythology." Kalevala, uh, that they they use that those texts for that. Well, it turns out that uh, J.R. Tol Tolkien, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, had used or borrowed a lot uh, from the Kalevala for the really? Lord of the Rings. Yes. Wow. Right. In fact, some of his imaginary languages were based on Finnish grammar. So it was very strange. Yeah. Very strange how just hearing something and then just, hearing the, mm -hmm. that there's like a circle that somehow came around. And there's no explanation for it. Hmm. No coincidences. No, you just you have, you to, be have open. to find them. Yeah. Yeah. You have to find them. Hmm. And often you find them in the strangest places. That's amazing. But that. That must make this whole creative process so interesting that you, at some point, you don't know what you will get, you know, that you, you don't know. find. Yeah. And that's the point. I, I really feel you can't go into this sort of thing um, with a with a preconceived notion uh or shall we say a prejudice that, you know, I want it to turn out this way. Uh, one has to go into it maybe with a general idea where it's going. Uh, and then again, it's research, research, research. Find the interesting things. What are the peculiar things out of your research? What are, what are the, the personal things? Mm -hmm. um, I, I created an opera uh, with Christiana Zeidler, a composer Christiana Zeidler from Gelsenkirchen. We did, um, I guess technically it's musique theater uh, within the opera world uh, because there's spoken dialogue. Uh, it's technically it's not an opera, which I don't quite understand, but whatever. Um, uh, we did one on Hildegard from Bingen. And again, that required lots and lots of research because you're dealing with a figure who has a certain standing or certain expectations regarding this figure. What are you going to do? I think it's important with his, when one's doing something on historical figures, one should not destroy the figure. One has to really work hard um, there are lots of traps along the way, or one can go off. In that particular case, as writing a modern piece, what would be easy and cheap would be to have a lot of uh, uh, anti-religion stuff in your dialogue, or you know, you, you want to get a, maybe a modern liberal spin 
Um, and to me, that's too easy, too cheap. Um, have to work within the world, that particular world, um, you know, in the Middle Ages world and the belief system, uh, and still be able to communicate to a modern audience. Um, one should not assume the audience, that, which does bother me sometimes. It, sometimes writers assume the audience isn't terribly smart. Okay. Uh, and that uh, I assume that the audience is smart. Um, first of all, why are they coming to the theater? Um, they, exactly. they, they must have some background. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, why, why aren't they just sitting on, uh, sitting on a computer game? They're in the theater. So I have a certain expectation of the audience. Um, and I'm hoping um, that I can take them from where they are and, and or grab them from where they are and take them a little further. Cause I've had the luxury of doing a lot of research. <laughs> yeah. So I'm happy to share, you know, some of the interesting yeah. things I found along the way, you know, and they might find it interesting also. Um, but but definitely. True. Yeah. It's true what you said. And it's also that the, the audience have an integrity also as, as yeah. sometimes do. you know, that you think, if you sit in a theater and you think, sorry, what is this, what you're giving me or what you're showing me, then you, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, you think, no, I'm not having this, you know, and, and exactly. even if yeah. you don't have the knowledge necessarily, but you have a taste or you have a integrity as well. So yeah, I totally agree with you that the audience knows you know? The audience knows, and and the, and the great thing is the audience. The audience is curious. Exactly, they're yeah. very curious. Then you also, it's my belief. That a lot of people would disagree with me, I, I suppose. But I always like to throw a couple things in a piece. I like to throw a couple things out to the critics in the audience, mm -hmm. meaning the, the people who are writing in the newspaper. I do like to throw a few things out there. Um, maybe it's a little mischievous of me but i like to throw a few things out there where i figured they don't know, they probably don't know this oh. <laughs> uh and they're going to hear it and they're going to go oh, oh hey I, I don't know that oh, okay. uh, like in the high in the high musical i don't know if the critics knew that uh johanna Spiri knew richard wagner very well mm -hmm. you know so i can put it in a line uh, something oh, like okay. yeah, yeah you know if where her son, Johannes Peary's son says, you know, if your friend Richard Wagner can write those uh, endless uh, operas, certainly you can write a little story. Mm. You know, and then the critic oh, is going to yeah. wait a minute. Hmm. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and it turned out uh, Johannes Peary's husband uh, was working for the Neuzerche Zeitung at that time. And he was writing positive critiques of Wagner's music. He was very, he was one of the early supporters of Richard Wagner. Uh, but nobody knows that. Nobody yeah. needs to know it. No one needs to know it. Yeah. But it's kind but of it's a interesting. Fun, yeah. It's a fun little tidbit. Yeah. You know, and then the, the, the critic has to go, oh, hmm, I better go check that out. Yeah. <laughs> you give them work to do. <laughs> give them work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If they want to write something negative, they can write it, you know, it's yeah. fine, but they're going to have to work for it. Exactly. Yeah. But I just wondered if you have thanked your daughter for dragging you to the film. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, does yes. She, yeah, does she say, Dad, I told you so. <laughs> and and I listen, I, I listen to them, you know, every really? now and then they will say, ooh, maybe you should go see this, and I'll go see it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're smart. Um, yeah. and the, um, my younger daughter, she picked up a Grimma prize a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, as a, as an actress, mm -hmm. um, and she has a, a good idea of what, of what is interesting, what, what could be interesting. Same thing with my old, older daughter, uh, both of them, you know, it, it, I had no way to, I couldn't get away from going to see the film because they both asked me and I promised. And even though I waited as long as I could um, to the last performance day in Berlin, I did go see it and they were right. Mm, they knew. So you never know. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> 
But John, this is amazing. It's just for me so fascinating. All the the different things you do, and like I say, you know, from Middle Earth to the to the top of the Alps, it's it's amazing, and everything in between. But now, what is what is the next thing for you? What is the wish for the future still? Um, well, there are a couple of, <laughs> there must be at least four or five things bubbling along. I mean, one that's a quite interesting is a, a musical, uh, right now it has the title, uh, 1848, uh-huh. um, which came to me, uh, from a composer, um, Philip Riedel, who wanted to meet up and he said i've had this project it's been in the back of my mind for 20 years uh at some point uh he he pulled out um copies of 64 uh sets of lyrics by hochman von fallersleben um called texanisch and leader okay texas songs you're thinking what i mean you 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 go this is this is insane um and so we're writing a musical now using uh, Father's Leben's lyrics about the 1848 revolution in Germany, uh, and well, actually in Europe, um, combined with uh, immigrants that leave and go to Texas. So a parallel story, sort of like Heidi was a parallel story with Johannes Spiri and, uh, and the Heidi story. This will be a parallel story uh, based on historical figures. And, and what I love about historical figures is sometimes you, you could not make up better names. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the char- characters is Far Fuchs. Oh. <laughs> well, well, you can't come up with something better than that. Um, so this will be a parallel story of people who are trying uh, to... Uh, create a better society and fail here in Germany um, and people who emigrate um, and try to find that society elsewhere or create that society elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, then the other thing bubbling along has to do with Mary Shelley, um, Lord Byron and uh the summer without uh, sunshine, 1816. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a volcano in Indonesia, and there was no summer. It just rained all summer in Europe. And then, of course, we also had the Irish uh, famine because of this event. Um, but we wanted to put these people together: Lord Byron, his doctor, um, Mary. Well. She became Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and their uh, and her stepsister. Um, you know where they came up with. They had nothing to do. They told ghost stories, and out of that came Frankenstein. Was one of the results, oh. and the first and the first vampire novel came out of it. So we kind of see this as that sounds interesting. Yeah, it's like Jim Morrison uh, as, you know, Lord Byron is a Jim Morrison type figure, super charismatic. He's the oldest. He's the oldest of them. And he was only 28. The youngest was 17. Um, So we have like young rock stars in a way um, confined in this villa and everything that's going on, interpersonal relationship. Um, of course, in those days, they were doing uh, laudanum um, and um, let's just say it was a very intense time with very intense people. And all of them were talented except for one. And we will tell the story from the perspective of the untalented one. Amazing. Oh, what a, what a good um uh perspective right. yeah <laughs> and they, and they all died young um relatively young um except for the untalented one um mm-hmm. so she has we'll say she has the right to look back on what happened so that's that's going to happen um and then we have one about a witch there's a, mm-hmm. there's a witch uh well, um the last Actually, well, she's not the last. She is the second to last witch that was executed in the 1780s. 
which is outrageous mm. uh, in Switzerland. Oh. Um, yes, and this woman was rehabilitated about 20 years ago, officially, quote, re rehabilitated. Oh. Um, so we want to explore this, uh, find this an interesting theme. And well, then this is, one, yeah. one, last, one last thing, that, because it, this was one crazy thing uh, I did with a, a um, travesty artist here in Berlin, uh, Jack Woodhead. Um, we wrote our version of a modern Cinderella. Oh, okay. Which I was thinking of calling Genderella, but I thought, yeah. no, maybe that's too much. Um, anyway, yeah, that's now, the other problem. You you seem to um, enjoy working with historical figures and and yeah. history, so you have this interest in history. Yes, yeah, I like working with historical figures. They don't. In the case of the of the Cinderella one, none of these are historical. Yeah. Uh, but of course, they're 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 characters we all know, mm -hmm. just in a different setting. Um, but historical characters are interesting, and it is important. I had a discussion with Susanna F. Wolf uh, recently. We were on a panel dealing with um, historical figures and how do you treat them. Uh, in a stage work, oh, yeah. um, how do you go about it? And I think I mentioned earlier, I try to be careful. I try to research a lot. I try not to destroy these characters. Um, I try to be as, you know, as faithful as I can. Um, then, of course, for dramatic purposes, uh, one is going to have to invent some things, but I like to find solutions that are at least plausible. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. If I don't know it did happen, I have to know it's plausible. Mm -hmm. In the case of Hildegard, um, I have a scene, well, it's an important scene, where she attempts suicide. Now, this is really taking a chance because there is no, there is no ev evidence. There's, there's lots of writings from Hildegard from Bingen. There's lots of lots of material. Um, when you say, well, how, how how on earth could you even conceive? I mean, she was a, a, a Catholic abbess. She knows that, that would that's a, that's a deadly sin. You go to hell. Um, how why would you think she would even think about that? Um, well, I researched the heck out of it. Um, and I do know um that where our the time our story takes place she was under severe mental stress mental and emotional stress her favorite nun had left her uh ricardus von Stade. and i also know that when this woman was 80 some years old a, a remarkable age for that time uh she allowed um she allowed a person to be buried on the church grounds who had committed suicide oh i see okay and then i thought First of all, why would she do why why would she do that? The Archbishop of Mainz said, "Don't do it." The Pope said, "Don't do it," and she did it. And the only conclusion, which seems pretty logical, is she had to have been at that point herself to understand. To me, there's no other explanation. Yeah, yeah not true. So it's I plausible. Also think that, yeah. So you you understand the character so. And this is from where you can deviate a little bit. Yes, where I feel I feel I have yeah. an art, artistic license to to deviate, uh, and I can go there, even even if it is not historically correct. It is pretty darn plausible when you yeah. add everything up, um, mm -hmm. and it also affords an opportunity to get her on the other side for a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, to see, because her big thing had been about the cosmos and the balance of the cosmos and da da da. Um, this affords an opportunity for her actually to go on the other side, um, which had been an experience of the of the composer Christiana Zeidler. She had been declared dead once upon a time as a kid, uh, and so she experienced the bright lights and all that sort of stuff, and was talked back, as she says, talked back in 
to herself and to her body and didn't want to do it. So I thought, well, this can't be any better than that. Here's a woman composer writing about a woman composer. I mean, Hildegard von Bingen is one of the major composers of the Middle Ages. Uh, and she's been, had that experience. So yeah, but one I has to do that. Yeah, and, and everything was not written because people didn't talk about these things always, you know, Correct. mental things, mental health and mental things. So it wouldn't probably exactly. be yeah. So um, yeah. And great that you put the human side to your characters, you know, to that's that's the that's the most important yeah. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. We have to as a as a as an audience member, we have to be able to step into their skin. Exactly. Yeah. If we're if we're to go on a journey with them, and maybe and we'll find things that are similar to our own experience, we maybe we find a solution to a problem we have. Yeah, but this is where I think the importance of art is really to, so that we can go to a theater and come back with something, and not just something yes. superficial, you know. But that yeah. you really, you really give the story this depth and these layers that you. That you sort of can find yourself in one of these characters, or or something about yes. yourself in one of these characters. So, it may, it may be that you find elements of yourself in a variety of the characters in the piece, yeah. and you have the opportunity to see how different parts of your own personality, how what what happens as they interact. You know, exactly. there are some results yeah. that are good. There are some results that are less good. And you can do this. You can do this whether it's whether it's a drama or a comedy. You should be able to do it in both in both areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. But how can you work on all these pieces so in parallel? I mean, do you do they sort of overlap sometimes? Where you where one one story mm-hmm. starts influencing the other, or do you keep them totally separate? I think I keep them pretty separate. I, I, I don't make a conscious effort to separate them, but I think they each have their own little world in my mind. Um, and yeah, I just go in that door, you know, uh, uh, for the day. Um, obviously, they're not they're not all running parallel. I would say the most intense period was when we with Sean McKenna and Stephen Keeling, we wrote the, we wrote the three Heidi musicals and the return of Peter Pan, which we wrote in 2006 and it's getting its premiere finally at Theater uh, Regensburg uh, on November 4th. Took a while for this thing to happen, uh, but it's happening. Um, But that particular, you know, those were uh, four musicals plus the Lord of the Rings within a period of six years. Um, so that was pretty intense. That was basically one after one. I, I didn't have that much to do with the Lord of the Rings once uh, the music side was sorted out. You know, who's going to be doing it? Uh, then I could I just step back. And the producer friend of mine, Kevin Wallace, you know, did this incredible production uh, in Toronto and London, and he just had a new version of it. Uh, very small version at the water mill outside of London. Um, but it was great to watch that to see, yeah, that music still works, whether it was large, you know, large scale or small. Mm-hmm. So that's that's also ex- extremely satisfying. But also this, uh, uh, that you mentioned this now about the time frame of these, uh, of the work, because I think also this is something we forget that it's not, you know, Two weeks ago, you decided you want to do a musical, and then now it's on stage. You know, it's a long process, long work involved, yes. and also the rehearsal times, and it's the casting, and it's finding everything, everybody working on it. So, um, what what would you say is a is a time frame that you give to yourself? Do not be disheartened to, to think, okay, no, when right. is this going to happen? Well. Uh... Once a, a team is put together, whether I'm writing or whether I, I find an author to write it uh, you know, and get the, put the team together, I like to set certain deadlines. I, and most people prefer to have deadlines um, and re- reasonable deadlines. 
uh, to get uh, first get an outline done rather quickly, then uh, from that outline start start the writing process, um, and get a first draft out. At the same time, the composer is following along a little bit behind the writer, um, and they have to, of course, be communicating with each other. And you know, then the composer is starting to catch up towards the towards the. Uh, um, once the writer is finished. Um, so everybody is sort of, there is an order in which things should happen. Um, always keeping in mind, there has to be uh, enough, um, uh, enough security time to kind of catch up um, and make sure that we're all kind of working parallel and getting it done. We know that when we have a first draft, we don't have to have a first draft of all of the music. We know that. Uh, and it would be foolish to think we could do that because at some point the thing has to be put on stage and we may find out actually we need a little more music for this scene change. Uh, so, I mean, that's not even going to be done until much later. So there's an order in which things should happen. It's nice to set a, uh, to set certain dates or rough period in which we think we can get it done um get to the point where we can have a reading an internal reading and hear what we've done uh is this good is it not <laughs> uh, i mean usually we know whether it's good or not uh, oh, okay. but, but there's nothing like having other people read it you know and there's an atmosphere yeah there's an atmosphere mm -hmm. in the room yeah um, and you, the thing that you thought was really funny, you realize, hey, it's not that funny. Uh, or we really took a wrong turn there. Uh, we need to revise or, or a figure is not uh, well thought out, that sort of stuff. And we always ask the actors, you know, for their opinion. How, how do they feel reading this character? Um, was it confusing or was it clear? Um, was there any language in it that seemed odd? Um, so we get this feedback from from actors, uh, and then we go to, into the rewrite process. And this process might happen a couple of times; it could be a couple of readings and rewrites. Um, and then you know we have something which we would call our uh, our author's draft. And we feel at that point, and this is important, if I have, if I really am in charge of the whole process, um, I keep all other people out of it, meaning there's no director. No director is going to have anything to say until this thing is finished, until the authors have done it. And the authors say, we feel this can go on stage. Then we will invite in a stage director or a producer um, and, and let them have their say. Um, but we do not let them into the creative process oh, until see. later. Uh, okay. Their creative process comes later. It doesn't come in during this time. Because if they came in, they would say, oh, um, I'm sorry, but this scene you have here is going to be really difficult to direct or it's going to cost too much we can't do it um and so then the writers don't have the freedom that they should have to write oh yeah it's the job of the director to put it on stage that's their challenge um it's not their challenge to tell the authors this could be difficult mm -hmm. And the authors are not dumb, obviously. The authors yeah. are all theater people. They know what is possible um, and what one can do with simple um, stage illusion. But how involved are you in the casting, for example? Because you must see, mm -hmm. you have the, you must have the idea of who you want or, or what these people, or what the person has to be like. It depends. Um, and some, let's say with the first Heidi musical, I was also the creative producer, meaning the creative producer for the for the production. In that case, um, of course, I was involved in the casting and had pretty clear ideas. The, the director is there, the choreographer is there, the music director is there, and everybody has what they're looking for. Music mm -hmm. director wants a great singer. 
uh, the uh, stage director wants a great actor, choreographer wants a really good dancer mm -hmm. or mover. Everybody has what they want, you know, and it, when I'm there, let's say representing the author team or being part of that team, I have also my my thoughts about it. But I know at this point you have to you have to let the child go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not now it's there. It's now their turn to be creative. The director, uh, the choreographer, the music director. Um, it's this is their chance. Um, and I need to step back a bit and only I'll offer my opinion, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to insist. Mm -hmm. It's now their turn. Mm -hmm. And I'm just hoping that they make the, the best decision. I mean, yeah. normally, normally you, you're sort of in agreement, you know, but occasionally yeah. you think yeah. mm, it could have been another way. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Yes. I wanted to ask now if you were if you've ever been a bit disappointed or or were you sometimes surprised or you were initially disappointed and think okay no but they've done it right they, they've yeah there, there have been cases where somebody was engaged and i was thinking boy are, uh, what are they sure they want this person uh, mm -hmm. and it's been a big surprise and they turned out to be be wonderful mm -hmm. um and i think there have been some they're all unfortunately sometimes the opposite case you know, where you think this is going to be fantastic and it's not that fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but I try to keep, I have a general rule, both with authors and with uh, what I call production creatives, meaning the, the stage director, choreographer. I, I will pose something, or, or whether it's a question or an idea about the way I think something should happen, I will pose it twice uh, and no more. Mm -hmm. Pose it once just to bring it up. Um, and then if I'm really, if I really believe in this, I will bring it up one more time and then I drop it and I have learned to be fine with dropping it. Oh, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because there are a hundred other solutions mm -hmm. to whatever whatever it is. And I'm not the only person with ideas. These, these people have ideas as well. So I have to trust them um, and let go of uh, of my conceptions of things. Oh, yeah. It would be, it's very rare that I would say it has to be this way. Mm. Well, I can, I understand that I've done this project in in Vienna over lockdown where I photographed um artists in their windows uh, I photographed around 500 okay. artists in the year wow. I did that exact thing I I decided I will ask and then mm -hmm. release and then never ask again and I, I don't persuade I didn't want to persuade I didn't want to yeah. I, I asked once and whoever answered whoever came on the project was supposed to be and I really believe that I found the right people who were on this mm -hmm. project because I learned so much from everybody and everybody gave so much for this project. Right. So I absolutely agree with you. It's I can I totally understand what you're talking about, that that release part where you've decided. You to have to let go. Okay. You have to let that go, yeah. yeah. And the right people come. At the right time, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I believe I believe the same thing. And you know, there's always um, the idea of getting totally stuck on something on, on one particular issue uh, and turning it into a thing uh, is simply going to slow you down, slow the whole process down. Mm -hmm. And you need the process to keep moving forward. Uh, you need. People need to feel like they're they're able to contribute without being stopped. Yeah. Uh, you got to let them move forward because you know there's there's all there's the next project coming up around the corner. You can't yeah. you can't get stuck. Yeah, yeah, and it creates a flow, I believe. You know, yes, between yeah. people, a wonderful yes. flow. Mm. Yeah, John, this is so lovely to talk to you. I mean, this is. It's so interesting what you're doing, and um, I can just imagine you—you you must look back on these things and just um, 
have such great memories and feel so proud of what you've achieved? It's it's been a um, I have to say it it, it is a um, it's a fortunate position and which I always keep reminding myself um, is, I'm lucky to be able to do this um, and it's been really fortunate to have the opportunity to work with wonderful people and wonderful minds um and maybe people, it's not luck maybe it's talent i think yeah, <laughs> you have a too. wonderful talent to do that yeah perhaps yeah now Patron, I think, thank, you, thank you very much for for this opportunity i really appreciate it's it a wonder, it's a wonderful pleasure okay Petra. okay john bye-bye okay,